Welcome to this week's video. So we have a lovely um, band-aid colored vanity and it is well past its prime. The veneer is chipped just all over the place. It's lifting and a bunch of others. And I mean, it's just, it's kind of hideous. It has an oak veneer. So some parts of it are solid. A lot of it's not. Um, the whole piece is solid wood. I just meant it's not completely solid oak. So what we're gonna do is turn it into nightstands. So I just take out the drawers and kind of figure out what needs to happen to be able to break it apart. With these vanities, every one I've done has been a little bit different. But if you take out the drawers and kind of peer inside, you can kind of see what's going on. This one is one of the more difficult ones I've ever done because instead of screws, it was nails and glue. The nails were also, I had some really, really long ones and also some smaller ones that were kind of hidden in the abyss of the drawers, so they were harder to see. So all I'm doing is working my putty knife all around the sides of the center drawer and there's a bunch of glue blocks in there so I'm just loosening up the glue blocks. This is damaging the veneer on the sides and I just know that it's going to need to be filled so it's just something that I'm prepared for. If you wanted to do this without any damage, I, I honestly don't think you could do without any, any damage. This piece in particular, I've done some without any damage. It usually is the ones that are put together with screws. This one was not. It was a bunch of nails and glue and that makes it really hard to get things off without messing the wood up. However, if you wanted to go a little bit slower, you could use steam and just work a little more gently. But like I said, I, I was fully prepared to fix damage. So I went a little aggressive on this one. So you can see the veneer pulling off and splintering. I knew that was going to happen. So all I did was go through and peeled off any extra pieces that just were too far gone and glued down ones that I felt like it would have been better for it to be glued down. You just kind of choose your battles in this scenario. If you wanted to, you could fully pull off all the veneer and just use the wood underneath. However, the, there were parts of it that were really stuck on there. So the amount of time that it would have taken to do that wouldn't have been worth it in the end. So all I'm doing is just taking off the loose pieces, gluing down the ones, like I said, that I felt needed to be glued back down and then we're just gonna fill it. These were very interesting knobs. <laughs> they were just screwed on pieces of wood and you could tell that they were meant to be screwed in the center. They weren't, they had two there. It was, they were interesting. I contemplated keeping them for a while, but then I ended up changing my mind, so. So this is the wood filler I'm using for this. This is just an Elmer's stainable wood filler. I have it in like a vat. I really like it for projects like this where I just need to smear on a bunch because it's inexpensive and it does the job. However, know that it is going to have a different consistency than the wood around it. So you have to prime when you do stuff like this because this is a huge fill job and you have to make sure that it, when you go to paint, all your surfaces are of equal consistency. So I just went ahead and let that dry overnight and then I'm going back in and just sanding it smooth. If there are any parts where you really feel like you have to do thick layers of this stuff, I would actually do a layer, let it fully dry, do another layer, let it fully dry. But this was mostly just like a skim coat to smooth everything out since there was so much veneer that I had taken off. I'm also keeping in mind that these pieces aren't perfect. They have been around for a really long time. It's not an antique, but it's certainly vintage. And with that, I mean, it has a life and sometimes lives lived that just, you, you don't really want to cover all that up. If you were doing a pristine makeover, sure. But for what you're going to get for a lot of these pieces, it's just not worth it to do a full on fix, if you know what I mean. So now I'm just 
filling in this front section here. It reminded me of the Olympics. I, it had to go. So I'm using the same wood filler, filling it in. I'll again let that dry overnight. And then I gave everything on this piece a full sand. Um, just to scuff sand over the paint. If there was any looser chipping paint, I wanted that to come off. You could see in the beginning, a lot of the finish was failing itself. So I just took everything down so that none, I didn't have any of the, you know, leftover bad paint hanging out there. So here I've got some air dry clay and I am just going to make a few molds. And I'm gonna put those over the Olympic rings because even though I filled them in, you'll still be able to kind of see lines in there and I didn't want that. So I chose a longer mold that would kind of cover up that entire area and something a little bit fancier because these aren't going to be Art Deco pieces when I finish. So I kind of wanted to get rid of that vibe and do something a little more feminine. And I needed something to gild, if we're being honest. There's nothing to gild on this piece, so I had to put something on there to make that happen. So this is really easy. You can put down anything in your mold to help the clay release. If you're doing this with resin, you never have to do that. Resin is really easy to get out, but sometimes the clay likes to stick inside your molds. So this is coconut flour. I've used baking soda, baking powder, uh, cornstarch, any, essentially anything that you have like that that will prevent sticking inside your mold. Just use it. It will make your life a billion times easier. And then after all that prep work was done, I am going through and giving this piece a good clean with my Chalk Mountain cleaner. There wasn't anything too crazy on it, so I didn't need an incredibly abrasive cleaner. And now my mold, you can see it's still flimsy. That's what I want because part of the surface of this is curved. So I'm putting it on while it's still wet and mobile. So I just did my tight bond quick and thick. And then to let it cure, I'm laying the piece on its back so that I don't have to fight gravity. I'm letting it work with me. And I just make sure that all the edges are sealed as gently as possible with my fingers because it is clay. It will move if you move it. And then I let the clay just about halfway dry so you can kind of see where it starts changing color and at that point in time I feel safe enough to go ahead and prime and I'm using my one two three primer in gray I always use the gray one um, and then that way when I go over the mold I'm not going to destroy it with my brush so it's dry enough to be able to handle this but still um, wet enough that this for me helps prevent a lot of cracking if you go over it with primer at this point. And then also, like I said, the primer is helping the entire piece have a consistent base for my paint. So I don't have any surfaces that are more or less porous than anywhere else. I went ahead and did two coats of this over the entire thing. And you saw me do it with a brush in like the detailed spots. And then I just took my foam roller and did it all over the larger flatter areas. Okay, and we gotta take a minute to talk about this Chalk Mountain. It's slow drying oil stain, and it is super cool. So I'm going to be using the white with this one. You, when you see it, when you first get it, it's kind of separated, so you have to shake it up really, really well. I showed you it in the brown because it was a little easier to see there. But this is the white, and it gives you a whitewashed look. And guess what? This is sealing your piece and doing everything all in one fail swoop, which is just super cool and you can do it in layers so it is slow drying so you have to keep that in mind it's not like you can't touch it or anything like that it just means that for it to dry to be able to you know give to a person or use you have to give it a little bit of time so even to do the second coat i left this overnight before i even attempted to do a second coat so you kind of add it on smooth it out and then the next day you can wipe back the excess oil and then add your second coat, you can go up to three coats on it. I only did two, I did two on this one here and then I'll, I'll 
tell you about the third coat later. <laughs> so you can see the second coat did quite a bit more. And this is again overnight. Now we're going to work on the print. This is another one of the florals that I just love. He just does amazing work and I have so many prints of his that I really, I just want to put on all my pieces because I just adore the way that he does stuff. Um, his name will obviously be in the description. I'm pretty sure I will butcher it because I'm not French, but his first name is Paul and it's like Delongpre or I, I don't know. It always reminds me of if you guys ever saw Ever After, the Nicole Delancre. Yeah, that's what he, his name reminds me of. But it's like Delancre. I'm probably ruining it. I'm sorry for anyone who actually knows how to say his name properly. But I love his work. It's beautiful. Anyways, I'm putting this on with my poly, as I always do. I'm starting around the edge there. And then I'm actually doing it with that bottom drawer in because everything right there needs to be the exact same. I push it around the curves, but I'm working in sections. So I did the side piece with Polly first, laid that down, and then I did the drawer with Polly, laid that down. And I'm just being so, so careful because this is super, super thin tissue paper. If you're using a thicker medium, it'll be much easier and you won't have to worry about so much. But this is what I'm using and it's, it's rough stuff. But it has a nice finish. So now that I have the drawer part laid down, you can see I'm adding poly on the third section there, and then I can wrap that around ever so gently. And you guys know I have tons of videos on this. If you need a slower one where we do something a little more close up, and I can do that for you, but I just, I feel like they're all kind of the same, and I don't want to bore everyone with the same thing every time. But when you work in curves like this and in sections, you do want to just do poly in sections. I would never coat this entire piece with poly and then lay down this paper. It wouldn't end well for me or my sanity. So there I'm just poking holes in the side going up the side of the drawer. It's so thin and it's still pretty wet that I wouldn't glide the knife through. So I'm literally just poking it through the paper on the way up until I get to that dry spot at the top. Same thing here. I'm very, very gently just kind of poking the knife through down the sides and I'm making sure that it kind of folds over on the inside of the edge. And then for the top of the drawer, I'm just going to use my trusty sanding block to get that off because that's the easiest way to do that. And it gives you a really nice finished edge. And then save that piece of paper if you're going over drawers like this. This is a really cool look, but it's kind of a pain. So if you're brand new to decoupaging tissue paper, I, I wouldn't recommend what we're going to do. <laughs> And then of course I'm taking the poly again and then just going over the entire thing, making sure that I am doing my due diligence and sealing in all the edges. You do not want your edges lift later. And the thinner the paper that you use, the more delicate it is. However, with that said, the thinner the paper you use, the more that it becomes like a part of your piece so that there's less of a chance of it trying to lift or come off anywhere else. So. You kind of pick your battles. The thicker papers are easier to work with and they look really good. The thinner papers are a lot harder to work with, but the potential for lifting and coming off is much slower. So this was a pretty simple blend and this is actually a really good for beginner piece because the colors are all very neutral and easy to blend together. The top is just a, it's called light gray. And I make sure that when I do stuff like this, the top is all one color. It's very easy to get to. The second color is medium khaki and it will blend perfectly into the light gray. And then I'm doing my goblin gray, which is, that will be a harder blend, but it's one of the main colors. And then at the very, very bottom, I'm using iron gate. So it's essentially a four color blend down the side. 
and I'm just going to go ahead and do the base coats. The base coat is never pretty. I never look at it and be like, wow, I did a really good job. Usually I look at it and I'm like, ah, oh, I'm really bad at this. And I just think that the entire time on all the sides that I'm doing with my base coat of blending because it just, it doesn't ever look good. But you're doing it and you're figuring out where you want your color placement to be and how you want things to kind of end up. And you're kind of starting to blend the paper into it. And you're just kind of doing all the things on your first coat and know that by your last coat, you're gonna feel better about yourself. So let's just, I'm gonna speed through all of this first coat because it's literally just going back and forth, adding water when I need it, throwing more colors on, kind of figuring things out. And then I'll make sure it's a little slower on the second coat so you can see. Remember those little scraps that we took off from the missing top drawer? What we're gonna do is cut out just the foliage part of these. I don't want just a strip running across the top drawer. I'd like it to look a little more kind of put together than that. And I can't blend over the drawer obviously because I'm leaving it the natural wood tone. So this is kind of my fix for that. So it's not just cutting off, it kind of still melds with the whole floral situation that we've got going on and matches, but I can still have that top drawer be wood grain instead of painted. So I'm just taking poly and this is my same poly that I always use and it is going over the oil-based stain. You can totally do this. Um, you do have to wait till the oil-based stain is fully, fully dried. That will change depending on your area, how hot it is, all that kind of stuff makes a difference. So anyways, I'm just being super, super, super delicate with this because the paper is now on top of being thin. It's also cut into very small pieces into one long strip. So I'm just trying to be very delicate with it. And I'm just very gently tapping it with my finger getting it on there and making sure that it lines up with the print on the bottom drawer. And then of course, sealing over it as you do. Now that that's done, we can start on the second coat. And before I do that, I always give it a quick sand. This is just a brush sand. I'm not going through anything. All I'm doing is smoothing out the finish and making sure there's no little nits or anything like that, little fuzzies that have been floating around in the air. All that's coming off with this, just to give me a very smooth to the touch feel. And then I'm starting with my top light gray color on this. You'll notice on the nightstands, I have one side that's slightly darker. That's because the image of the flowers, one side is darker and the other side is lighter. So the nightstands follow that theme around. So this is the darker side and I'm starting in with the light color, bringing it down. You can start from light to dark or from dark to light, whichever your preference is. It doesn't matter. Usually I go one way and then the other on the first coat to second coat. But really, it, I mean, to me, it doesn't ever matter. It always just kind of works out. So you do you. So I said I would try and keep this one a little bit slower so that you could see more of what I'm doing. And all I did was I already blended the medium khaki into the light gray because that's super easy. You barely have to touch anything to make that blend. But then I'm adding in the goblin gray and that's kind of the deep teal color. And I'm just getting that all over before I even worry about mixing the Goblin Gray into the medium khaki because that's a harder blend. 
So I'm just making sure the colors are on there, they're wet and ready to go when it's time for me to start blending them. And then I'm take, keeping my goblin gray, wow, my goblin gray brush. I am just going in circular motions back and forth and I'm going to just keep doing this and then adding more color if I need to, more lighter, more darker, depending on what I'm doing. And just know that when you have two colors that are so far apart, it's gonna take a little time to blend them and you just work with it and give yourself the grace that you need to know that, yeah, it's gonna take a minute. Your arm might even get a little bit sore. <laughs> that, that could happen. So if you don't want to do that, don't go with colors so far apart, but you know, if you'd like an arm workout. I will also switch hands periodically <laughs> because it does get a bit tiring. As you can see, I came up to the top and I'm now swirling back down in the circular motions again, and then I'll go back over it in horizontals. It's just back and forth with all the different techniques, getting everything on there and just getting it to a point that I'm like, oh, okay, this is good. I like it, I like where, where we're headed. And then that's going in with the medium khaki brush just to add more lightness to it because I thought it was getting too dark up at the top. So I just went in the, with the medium khaki brush and started working that down into the goblin gray instead of up into the khaki. But yeah, I, I hope this is slow enough that you can kind of see what is happening. I've, I have had a couple people mention that they'd like to have it a little slower. It, guys, if I did this too slow, it would, I mean, these videos would be forever long. But with that said, each side of this cabinet took me, the very first blend that I did took me eight minutes and then all the ones after that, because I kind of had a better idea, they took me about seven minutes each after that. So, you know, between, we'll call it seven and a half for each side average. And then I obviously did each side twice. That gives you an idea. And here, of course, I told you I was going to do gilding. So I've got my rub and buff here and I'm just hitting the high points on that. The reason I chose gold is because when I went through my hardware stash, I found these little, um, little guys that I just had in there and I wanted to use them and they perfectly covered up the holes that were already on there. So I didn't have to do any filling. Cause remember initially I said I was going to try and keep the original drawer pulls, but they were just too big and kind of gaudy for what this piece was. And I wanted something a little more delicate. And these guys just so conveniently perfectly covered those other two holes. And now I have to add in a center hole for those. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to drill out the hole. This hardware is gold, so it will match the gilding wax that I put on there and all will be right with the world. So here I'm taking my poly. I always keep a, I've shown this before, I have just refillable bottles of the Chalk Mountain Poly and then one I do a uh, gray. I keep like a little bit of Iron Gate mixed in with it. So I have a darker poly and a lighter poly. So for these, I just mix those two together because I didn't want them that gray. So I took my regular poly and mixed it with my already tinted poly and did a light gray sealed. This whole thing got two coats of poly and she's ready to go. Oh, hi, Taryn here. And uh, what do you think? Ice stands are done. They're looking awesome. This is a really great thing to do with those old vanities that aren't getting much use. Tons of them show up on my marketplace and nobody wants them just because nobody really has those huge vanities in their rooms anymore. There's not enough room for them. And most people get ready in the bathroom. Um, so this is a good option. The, had it been in like pristine condition, I obviously wouldn't have taken it apart. But since the finish on this was failing, and when I say finish, I mean the, the actual veneer was failing in a lot of spots and so it just, I'm not gonna peel off veneer and put new stuff down. It's just, it's not worth it. So now they're something that people will really, really love and they will be around for many, many, many years to come. So this is a good option for these really old pieces that 
kind of are just showing up everywhere where you want to keep them, you know, around, but just not necessarily in the state that you find them. So, okay, quick thanks to all of you guys. Just thank you so much for the love and support and comments and all your guys' sharing and just, I can't thank you enough. You're so awesome. I'm going to say it every time because you are. All right, let's get you some photos on these things.